to introduce Mikhail Vejdemo Johansson, who will be speaking today on multiple hypothesis testing with persistent homology. Thank you, Mikhail. And thank you for having me. The web seminars have been exciting to see ever since we started doing them. Um, I want to reinforce Henry's uh, pre-show instructions. I tend to thrive on being interrupted. Uh, if you have thoughts or questions, please speak up and uh, I'll follow wherever the conversation takes us. So I want to talk about some work I've been doing lately, uh, jointly with Cheyenne Mukherjee at Duke and building on work that I did with, a, with an undergraduate student here at CUNY, uh, where we develop methods for uh, controlling for uh, multiple hypothesis testing errors when you do uh, hypothesis testing with persistent homology. And so the things that we have created, the things that we're contributing in this work is, on the one hand, we've been studying how to do acyclicity testing, uh, how to check whether a uh, point cloud is topologically simple or whether there's any say, an important feature present in it. And the way we the approach that is by proposing a null model. So the idea here is not, are all the bars tiny? The idea here is to check, could the diagram that we get have been generated from a particular family of uh, point clouds? The model we're proposing is to take uniformly sampled points in a region, and we have some reasons why that might be a good null model, good default, a good model for what structurelessness means. Uh, and then we propose methods for controlling both family-wise error rates and false discovery rates. And if you're not familiar with the multiple hypothesis testing type language and ideas, family-wise error rate is the classical way of handling multiple hypothesis testing. The idea is that in order uh, to build methods that uh, keep the probability of making even one single false rejection, even one single false discovery among all the tests that you're performing, uh, stick to a, to a probability level you pick in advance. Uh, this is often too harsh. It's a very, it's a very, very high requirement to want all of your tests to come out uh, with only true discoveries, no false rejections. So the more modern way of doing multiple hypothesis control is to control the false discovery rate. And when you do that, you acknowledge that some proportion of tests are going to come out as false discoveries. If I do 10,000 hypothesis tests and I want to say 1% uh, confidence level, then I should be expecting about 100 of these to come out as false rejections. And so false discovery rate tries to control so that the proportion of false discoveries stays at the confidence level that you pick in advance. So as I go through this talk, I want to start out by uh, surveying a little bit about what's been done already in hypothesis testing. And this is something people have been looking at for a while. There's a bunch of different uh, methods that have been proposed, ideas that have shown up in how to approach the idea of doing hypothesis testing in persistence. And there's a couple of concepts from statistics I need to introduce uh, to have the language to speak about the things that we do. And then I'm going to walk through all of our contributions. I'm gonna show you how to do uh, acyclicity testing with a null model. I'm going to show you how to control for multiple testing. I have some simulations uh, that give us numbers on uh, how well we're actually doing. And I'm realizing now that I look at this list, I think five, six, seven might be in the wrong order. I think I pushed the power and level estimates to the very end. But I have numbers that show us how close we get to uh, preset uh, confidence level when we actually take this algorithm and put them into action. And uh, so one of the work, one of the 
statistical methods that have emerged is some work by Robinson and Turner, where they propose a two sample test. The idea is, is this cloud group of point clouds similar to that cloud of point clouds? And to test this, they have a method that uh, where you permute membership in the two groups between the point clouds and calculate the cost and do your testing on this these costs. And that's a setup that also lines up with, that also works with the false discovery rate control methods that we propose. So a couple of things that you might want to address when you do hypothesis testing. Uh, the one that led me in here is whether a persistence diagram shows any structure whatsoever. Or if you have a collection of point clouds, a collection of persistence diagrams, which ones actually show structure? Where is the point cloud trivial? Where does the point cloud have topologically uh, detectable structure? Where do they uh, where do they have actual homology? We're all used to, I'm guessing, uh, we're all used to the line of argument that goes, well, if we have a point in our persistence diagram far enough from the diagonal, if we have a sufficiently large bar in the barcode, then that's a salient feature. That's something important. And then the method, the, the problem really becomes all about figuring out what large enough actually means. Uh, so that's what's been underlying a lot of the statistical methods we have been developing. And then you can also ask, once you have several groups of persistence diagrams, say I pick point clouds from two different places, say I'm generating my point clouds from genetic data, and I have people who suffer from some ailment and people who don't, and I want to see if there's any difference in those groups. I can take persistence diagrams generated from genetics, generated from one of the groups, and compare it to the persistence diagrams generated from the genetics from the other group. And I can ask myself, is there anything homological, anything persistently homological that shows a difference between the two groups of diagrams? And doing that, we're no longer looking for whether there's any structure. We're looking for whether the structure is different. But that's also something where we can build a hypothesis test. And that's uh, where the Robinson and Turner work and some work building on that to extending from two sample tests to many sample testing. So something like what you would have with an ANOVA uh, addresses. So the first thing, as I remember, the, this developing. The first thing that showed up when it comes to introducing harder statistics uh, to uh, persistence comes from Peter Bubnik and the persistence landscapes work. The idea is that behind persistence landscapes is to take a persistence diagram and convert it into a function that goes from a countable number of copies of the real numbers to the real numbers. And so basically you build a landscape here by putting out triangles over each, over each bar. And when you have several tri triangles overlapping, you take the overlap and put it in the next row over. And then you put, take the threefold overlap in the next row over. And this gives you sort of a wavy dune-like almost uh, structure. Now, once you've done this conversion, you have a function. And functions can be combined point-wise. And so with persistence diagrams, with persistence landscapes, the way that statistic enter, statistics enters is because point-wise, point over each uh, pair of a real number and a natural number, we just have a bunch of numbers. And having a bunch of numbers, we can then start taking means, we can take, uh, take standard deviations. We get a central limit theorem. We can start analyzing families of persistence diagrams by taking pointwise approximations with normal distributions and combining those. <clears throat> Later on, uh, Brittany Fassi and a whole bunch of uh, collaborators have been looking at uh, persistence diagrams. They've been generating confidence regions uh, and once you have a confidence region, you can see whether there's any part of the confidence region that doesn't intersect the diagonal, and that gives you a hypothesis test. If there's nothing 
in the confidence region, then it's like the diagonal, then it couldn't possibly be trivial because it's too far away. But if there are, if everything does intersect the diagonal, you could know you couldn't exclude that it could have been a trivial uh, structure to begin with. And so the way that uh, this work approaches everything is through stability. We know that if things don't vary, if the function we put uh, on on a space doesn't vary by much, then the persistence diagrams don't vary by much. And so we can do things to estimate uh, what varying by much should mean for a particular data set by taking Hausdorff distances between samples from the data set to the full data set itself. And this gives us some sense of how much variance we get in the underlying point cloud. And that amount of variance we can then take to pick a uh, size for the for boxes that we put around each point in the persistence diagram. And this size of the boxes that we put around the persistence diagram can be estimated either from the date and subsampling or by <clears throat> creating, using distance to measure techniques, calculate an empirical distance to measure uh, from the data and then do a bootstrap sample to calculate uh, more versions and compare how these distances between the observed and the bootstrapped distances to measure compare. And that also gives us a um, function whose variation we can look at and where the variation of that function gives us a bound that we can use stability to transport into persistence world and transport into bottleneck distances. And then comes Robinson and Turner, uh, who address the question of, well, if we have two groups, can we tell whether they're different? What they do is compute all pairwise bottleneck distances, possibly beforehand, possibly lazily, so that you compute a distance when you need it and save it in case you need it again. And they propose a cost function that accumulates in-group distances, because the idea is, if they are different, then distances within the x's and distances within the y's should be shorter than distances between the x's and the y's. So by accumulating all the in-group distances, you get a measure of how expensive this particular split into point clouds is. And if the, this split is much, much cheaper than if we were to distribute the point clouds between the groups, if we were to permute the group assignment, then that gives us a reason to believe that they're different. Uh, and if the cost doesn't change much, depending on which point clouds and belong to which group, that's a sign that there might not actually be that much of a difference. So you take these costs, you permute the point clouds between the two groups many, many times, and this gives us <clears throat> an empirical distribution of how these distances should behave. And then we can look at where does the observed value fall in this empirical distribution. And if the observed cost value is extreme, then we can, then we, if the observed cost value is extremely low, then we get support for believing that the point clouds are actually different. Whereas if it's somewhere in the middle of everything, or even if it turns out to be surprisingly high, then we don't have any support to believe that the two point clouds are significantly different from each other. Vikal, can I ask a question? Yes. So I, th I think this paper is fairly new. I'm not as familiar with it as I would like to be. My question yep. is, um, you know, there's now a whole bunch of ways to turn um, persistence diagrams into other representations, such as landscapes, et cetera, vectors. Um, because the bottleneck distance is pretty hard to compute, have people tried doing the same type of idea on some of those other representations, like vector representations? Things of that nature. Are you aware of what's along those lines? I suspect no, because Robinson and Turner's work is pretty new. Uh, uh -huh. It would be exciting to see. I suspect landscapes would work reasonably well here. You can just create your landscapes, and that that gives you group-wise uh, averages, and you can put out confidence regions of landscapes and see whether they ever stop. Uh, intersecting each other, and that would give you some support for it. Thanks. Um, you could certainly do this with whatever invariants you feel like. In fact, 
the things that I will be developing <clears throat> start out assuming that you pick a numeric invariant. And I have a suggestion, but I'm not particularly uh, committed to my particular suggestion. So I think, I think the idea of picking up these methods and seeing how the input can be tweaked and see whether we still get a reliable method and whether we might get a computationally cheaper method that way is a really interesting one, one question and one that should be pursued. Thanks. And so there was a paper even more recently following up on uh, Robinson and Turner by Sericola Johnson, Kears, Crock, Purdy, and Torrance, who pick up their cost function and modify it to take not just two groups of persistence diagrams, but some arbitrarily large family of persistence diagrams. And then the question becomes an ANOVA type question. Is it the case that everything came from the same source? Or could it be that some of the diagrams, no, we don't know which one, but could it be that one of the diagram groups comes from somewhere else. And so again, by permuting group membership, we can get many different values of the cost function. If the cost for the observed split is much cheaper than any of the permuted costs, then we get support for believing that there was something different among them, that there is something that isn't aligned with everything else. So the same basic idea, but extended so that we can handle multiple testing. Now the Sericola et al. paper ends roughly where I begin. So one quote I pulled out of the paper, as they're writing down their conclusion, they've developed this whole ANOVA style thing. And then they say that, well, if such differences do exist, we then propose using a number of post hoc, i.e. two space permutation tests, to identify the specific pairwise difference. And this sentence in an introduction to statistics course would be immediately followed by, and when we do that, we need to correct from multiple testing. And so we should grab Bonferroni correction to adjust our p-values so that we don't over, uh, overestimate significance just by having repeated uh, post hoc tests. And that sentence doesn't show up in the paper, which is one of the reasons why I'm doing the work that I'm doing here. Now, I want us to lay down some uh, symbols for particular things that could go wrong or particular things that could uh, cause uh, us to reject the null hypothesis, to find significance in a test. And so, we could, give it, given a hypothesis, the hypothesis could be true or it could be false. And we could reject the null or we could fail to reject the null. Those are the things that go into hypothesis test. It could be true or false. We could believe it to be true or false. And so in this matrix here, U and S are the correct behaviors. Uh, U counts the number of times that the null hypothesis were true and we still believe it to be true. S counts the number of cases where the null was rejected and we should reject the null. And then V and T count false discoveries <coughs> uh, or missed discoveries, the two kinds of errors that we can make. <coughs> so I'm going to be using V to count false discoveries or false positives or type one errors. Personally, I hate the terminology of type one and type two. It's one of the most opaque things I've ever seen. Uh, there's nothing in the term that tells you what it actually is. Uh, T is the symbol that I'll be using for missed discoveries or false negatives. There was something, but we didn't see it. Or type two errors. And there are two, <coughs> sorry, rates that are commonly uh, studied here. There's the rate of false discoveries, alpha, that's the thing that you start out with when you decide to do a test. You pick a confidence level. That is to say, you pick the level of uh, the probability alpha that you will accept. And then beta is the probability of missed discoveries. 
there's also I'm realizing now uh, one more uh, symbol that I'll be using later on that I haven't put in here, and that is uh, I'll be using R uh, for the total number of rejected uh, things, and we're going to be needing that when we get to the false discovery rate control. So the there's a danger in repeated testing because every time you do, do, do a test, you have, have some probability of giving a false discovery. So when we do lots of them, we inflate that, uh, that rate. And I'm realizing I might be going a little bit slow. So I'm going to be speeding up a little bit so I get to the meat of what I'm doing. Uh, the point I want to make here is it's dangerous to do repeated testing. We need to do something to keep uh, the error rates uh, at the level that we believe them to be. And there's a bunch of traditional ways to do it. Bonferroni correction is usually the first thing that you see. And it points out that, well, if we expect alpha times k, if we did k repeated tests, and we have a significance level of alpha, we can expect alpha times k of our k repeated test to be significant. So if we want this alpha times k to really come out as alpha, we can replace our significance level by alpha divided by k. Or alternatively, we could inflate all the p-values by a factor of k. Now, the prob probability laws used here, the addition law for probability, uh, only really holds if each testing significant is a disjoint event from everything else. And it's conceivable that more than one test could be significant at, at once, which means that Bonferroni overcorrects. It's too strict. It's known to be conservative. It's known to uh, not reject when it should. And so there are versions. Uh, Holm and Hofberg have each one pretty famous version that adjust the Bonferroni correction so that you look through multiples of alpha over k as possible cutoffs. And, uh, look for when the p-values uh, start exceeding the, or the uh, multiples of alpha over k. There's something uncomfortable here. We're replacing our alpha by alpha over k. So if I want a 1% confidence level and I do 10,000 different tests, all of a sudden the confidence level I'm going to need to be using is something like uh, one millionth. And when you do permutation testing, when you do simulation testing, when you do all, all the things that we do in persistence, you're, comp you're going to be needing to do repeated computations. And they're going to have to scale with uh, alpha. You have to go to scale at least as one over alpha, which is bad news if you need to do dramatic corrections. So it's worth looking for, especially if we expect to need to do many tests, it's worth looking for ways to get a different approach to correct, correction, one that doesn't require us to use uh, alpha over k, even if we modify it. So uh, I'm going to be speeding through this one, but the basic setup that we have is we have two competing hypotheses, a null hypothesis and an alternative. Uh, we pick some statistic, uh, something that we can calculate from the data. And for this statistic, there's some range of values of the statistic that lead us to accept the null hypothesis, some that lead us to reject the null hypothesis. And the idea is picking our region so that the probability of rejecting the, no rejecting the null in error, I have a typo on this slide here, uh, sticks at our confidence level. And this statistic could be any, anything that actually measures the thing that we want. Uh, in uh, Fasi et al, we, do, we work with house score for L infinity distances. In Robinson Turner and Sericola et al, we work with this loss function that works on barcode distances, the bottleneck distances between the barcodes. And I will be proposing a different one. So what I care about what I cared about starting out here is acyclicity. When do we have a trivial uh, point cloud? And when do we actually have structure in it? And so rejecting acyclicity means that we have structure that is visible in the homology. 
So with FAS et al's confidence regions, we could check whether all the regions intersect the diagonal, and that would give us a test. Um, they use the stability theorem to produce their uh, confidence diagrams. So it's not going to be a particularly tight bound. Uh, it might be, uh, we, we get a bound, we get a science motivated by the data, but there, it doesn't come with very strong guarantees of it being a very good bound or very, very small uh, confidence region. So the plan I set out with is to pick pick some notion of what it means to be trivial. And I'll just compare the observed point cloud to a whole bunch of trivial point clouds and see what happens. And now there's some work by Bobrovsky, Kalen, Skrava where they investigate uh, random uh, geometric graphs on uniformly distributed points. So you take, you take points, you distribute them uniformly at random in some region, then you calculate Vitoris Rips uh, homology of those, and you see how the persistence bars distribute. And they find out in the work that uniformly distributed points tend to have very, very short bars. And if I look outside of our field, if I look at spatial statistics, uh, the first model that is brought up uh, to model what it means for a point cloud to be random is uniformly distributed points. So this seems like a good candidate for having a model for what it should mean to not have structure. So that's what we're going, what I'm going to propose for us to work with, that uh, structurelessness can be taken to look like having uniformly distributed points. So this gives us <clears throat> one uh, option from Robinson Turner. We can have our potentially acyclic point cloud X. We can simulate n minus one additional point clouds from our null model. And notice when I said uniformly distributed points, I really should decide how many points and in what region. And the idea I have is for those to be given by the point we're comparing against. So we estimate a bounding box of the point. Uh, there's some statistical uh, analysis that goes into picking a good estimator, but it's reasonably easy. I didn't include it in the slides, but if you want it, I have it. And so you simulate as large point clouds as you have, same number of points in a bounding box, uh, unbiased by estimated bounding box of your point cloud. And that way you get a whole bunch of point clouds that if our X was trivial, should look quite similar to X. And then compute uh, the Robinson Turner approaches. Once you have these endpoint clouds, you compute all the pairwise distances, and then you do the permutation, uh, group permutation testing. This will require you to do uh, n squared minus n divided by two different bottleneck distance computations. That's a pretty steep uh, workload. Even if we, even if we ignore having to do all the uh, persistence homology computations, it's quite a lot of work after you're done with the homology. So my idea going into this is, well, what if we picked a better test statistic? Or better is possibly not the right word to use here. What if we picked an easier test statistic? Instead of doing bottleneck distances, <clears throat> let's just see how far away we are from being the trivial diagram. We compare each diagram to the completely empty diagram. And if the diagram is empty, all the bars have to match with the diagonal. And so the bottleneck norm, the distance to the empty diagram, is going to have to be the length of the longest bar. Maybe up to a, up to, up to a constant uh, factor. You might wanna multiply or divide by square root of two. I don't quite remember which one to get the uh, distance in the persistence diagram, but up to, up to rescaling, uh, the bottleneck norm is just the length, long, length of the longest bar. So now we don't need to do any matchings. We don't need to do any bottleneck distances. The price we pay is that we're not actually using bottleneck distance between points. We're using bottleneck distances to a single reference point. But it's the same reference point for everything. And it's a, a reference point that doesn't care about structure. So it's probably less insane than it could have been. 
And Nick Allen, in this is in this slide, T sub X is this bottleneck norm, <clears throat> bottleneck norm that you're talking about, the length of the longest bar. Yes, I'm going to be using T sub X and T sub Y to refer to whatever the statistic is that you happen to be using. I see, great. And I'm going to be talking about null point clouds and that's for whatever null model you happen to want to be using. My suggestion is for you to use uniformly distributed points as your null model and bottleneck norm as your statistic, but nothing in the methods that I described relies on you doing this. Got it. So if you have reasons from your application field to use something else, or if you Gaussian have a better idea work. than I have for what works well, then pick that and the methods I described will still apply just as well. Very cool. So this gives us a test for acyclicity. That goes like this. We have our space X, we simulate one n minus one additional point clouds. Why? Uh, we compute all the persistence diagrams. We have n persistence diagram computations. We compute our bottleneck norms, that is n different calculations of what the longest bar is. And we sort everything. And we see where does our long, the longest bar in our input point cloud x rank among all the trivial ones. And that gives us <clears throat> something that we can estimate a p-value and uh, uh, figure out how rare the size of the uh, size of the bar that we observe really is. And that gives us something where we can quantify how certain we are that this is actually something different from the kind of behavior we would see in our null model. I wanna mention by the, uh, as a little by the way that we could of course build build ourselves a new metric from the bottleneck norm just by uh, adding norms uh, instead of checking how to go directly from uh, one space to another. See, well, how far would it be if we trivialized both spaces and sort of went from one to the other by way of the empty diagram? And because of the triangle inequality, this is going to be an upper bound on the bottleneck distance. I don't know how it compares to any L infinity distances, or I haven't really looked particularly much at stability questions. I don't even know how to articulate a conjecture on it. But it's uh, th there is a relationship sitting there with the bottleneck distance. If nothing else, we know that the norm will, if the bottleneck distance is large, then the norm will get pushed up as well. So the, I talked a little bit about this when uh, maybe half of you were already here and before we got started. What motivated me to do this in the first place was a question I worked with, on with Alisa Leshenko, one of the undergraduate students here at uh, CUNY. The question is this, when we do mapper, we create a cover and we create a nerve complex from the cover and use that nerve complex as a stand-in from for the entire data set and believe that to be a picture, a model of the shape of the data. One of the fir first places I've ever seen people talk about nerve complexes and covers is in the nerve lemma. And the nerve lemma is, well, it's a family of theorems, one for every notion you might have of what simple or trivial means, that says some things like this. If your cover is good, where by good we mean that all intersections of all collections of cover elements are simple for whatever notion of simple we pick, then the NURB complex is similar to the full space in a way that is parametrized by what we believe simple to mean. So if we have uh, contractibility everywhere, then we get a homotopy equivalence. If we have no significant homology everywhere, so reduced homology is zero, then we get uh, isomorphic homology groups. Uh, there's one version introduced by uh, Primoz Grava and I think one of his students, I got, I think maybe, uh, where they give a persistent homology nerve lemma so that if you know that everything, uh, that all your component point clouds have a particular uh, bottleneck distance to the empty diagram, a particular bottleneck norm, then from that you can calculate uh, distance between your uh, point cloud and the 
uh, and the corresponding nerve complex. There are some subtleties going into that that I'm not going to go into right now. So the idea we had then is, well, if we have a mapper complex and a cover, we can go and take a look. We can see, is this good? And if it is a good cover, then that might give us extra reason to believe in our mapper analysis. And if it's not a good cover, hopefully we'll be able to see why it's not good. And in the best of world worlds, go in and modify our cover, refine it, so that we get a new mapper complex that is better. Now, for the nerve lemma to fail, it's enough that one single uh, intersection displays uh, topological structure. So this is a this is a perfect setup for what's called family-wise error rate correction, where the thing we care about is the probability of making even one single uh, false discovery. And that's that's the realm where Bonferroni and Holm and Hochberg all are in play. And if we want to do this with acyclicity testing, and we do this with the null uh, model, then all of a sudden our the number of uh, <clears throat> The number of simulations and persistent homology calculations we need to do grow, grows proportional to the k, k, the number of tests we need to perform. So that's awkward and computationally intense and not that much fun. So the idea then is, well, here I have three point clouds. They have different densities. They even have different bounding boxes. And I generate a I generate a whole bunch of simulated point clouds that all look like the original somehow. And from this, the idea we have, the idea that we developed with Cheyenne is instead of scaling up the simulations, maybe we could standardize our test statistic across different size point clouds, across different dimensions, preferably even, uh, so that whatever bottleneck norm we get out here, uh, has the same sampling distribution as the bottleneck norms we get here, has the same sampling distribution as the bottleneck norms we get here, up to some modification based on the density and the shape. And so if we can estimate this uh, modification within each family separately, then we could get out some sort of modified test statistic that is comparable between the three rows, and then we can use each column here as a separate simulation and just look for, well, if we're looking for extremes, we can take the uh, largest value in each column and compare those. And all of a sudden we cut away all of the repetition. So that gives us the following approach. We simulate for each input point cloud Xi. We simulate N minus one additional point clouds Yij. We calculate persistent homology and our test statistic for everything. And using only the yi's, we can estimate a mean and a standard deviation for the test statistic and do the classical z-score standardization. You take your statistic value, you subtract the mean, you divide by the standard deviation. The key here is so we standardize the x as well using the thing that we estimated from the null model. So now everything behaves as if the y's was the truth, and which is what we want. We want to see whether x conforms to a world where the wise model the truth. And at this point, if things are nice enough, then we have Xi's and Yij's here that have the same sampling distribution, no matter what shape and density point cloud they came from. And so those can be compared to each other. And we can do the same thing. We can rank them all. We can see how extreme the observed values are among all the values. Where the next step, once we standardize everything, is we treat each column as a separate uh, simulation. We pull out the column maximum and we compare those. The conditions for this to work are we need to be looking for large values of t. If we look for small values of t, we need to do, replace these max with min, and we need to reject when it's small, but that's an easy fix. We need to be interested in family-wise error rate. This is, some, this is a way of excluding making even one false call. The whole setup here is built to do that. And we need for the standardized statistics to follow the same sampling distribution after standardization. There's no reason why the maximum bar, bar length, the uh, bottleneck norm should be the same 
if the density varies. But the standardization might work the same. That's the hope for this to work. Uh, which is exactly what I'm seeing on this slide. So let's move on. And we've done some experiments. So here are uh, quantile plots for uh, zero dimensional and one dimensional homology of points in boxes in the plane, uh, where uh, in each case we've taken different number of boxes, diff sorry, different size boxes, different number of samples. We calculated uh, maximum bar uh, with the bottleneck norm for each. We used that to, uh, we repeated that many, many times to generate a sampling distribution for each shape. And I pick shape and density combinations at random and compare them. And so I couldn't tell you right now which things are combined because I didn't bother writing that down. Uh, but basically what we, what we should be looking for here is these are the standardized scores. And if the standardized scores behave roughly the same, then these uh, points should align on a line that follows the blue line here, which is the reference for equal distributions. And just on this glance, it looks like a pretty good fit. Of course, there's more work I need to do in order to give some sort of strong, uh, reliable uh, ev evidence for this claim. But my basic conjecture here is that it works. And the reason I'm making that conjecture is pictures like this one that I produce from simulated data. And so, Mikhail, in these plots, one of the axes is your actual data, and the other axes is is your null model data coming from your uh, null model. Both axes are different instantiations of the null model. I see. I see. So right now, I'm trying to figure out whether my analysis of how standardization work uh, works works. Right. And I only, only need to care about the null model when checking that because I only care about the null model at all at this stage. Uh, deviations from the null model could look any way. I have no control over what signal looks like, but I can make sure that what, whatever I assume for the null model is actually true for the null model. And that's what I'm trying to argue here. And I have a motion detector in my office. So uh, if we get an algorithm out of this, that I basically already walked through. Given point clouds x1 through xm, sample out n minus 1 matching point clouds from the null model for each of them, calculate all our persistent homologies and test statistics, estimate mean and standard deviation row wise from the yi, yi's, standardize each row to form xi and yij comparable sizes, compute column wise maxima, and rank the maximum from the x's among the maxima from the y's. And that rank gives us a p-value that we can then compare against the cutoff. Now to switch gears, I also want to tell you about how to deal with false discovery rates. Uh, the false discovery rates starts out, suppose that we're performing k different hypothesis tests. Instead of trying to prove uh, try, trying to control the probability of making even a single false discovery. Let's re, let's chill out a bit. Let's relax a little bit. Let's just control how many false discoveries we're making. And so we're going to write QFDR here for the false discovery rate. That is to say, the expected value of false discoveries divided by all discoveries. So how many out of the discoveries that we made are wrong, are false, false positives? And this is the rate that we want to control and we want to estimate and we want to figure out how to keep this at an acceptable uh, error rate or acceptable confidence level. So by just extending uh, V and R here by, divide, by a division by the total number of observations, we see that the rate of the numbers is the same as the rate of the proportions. And these proportions uh, of the and proportion of R, we can estimate from data and estimate from simulations. So using that uh, null model or uh, null hypothesis test statistics, we can estimate the proportion of these. And using the observations, we can estimate the proportion of R. So we estimate false discoveries by seeing 
how often do we get a discovery when we know that we shouldn't? In the permuted uh, groups or in the simulated data sets, how often do we reject the null? And the total number of the total rate of discovery we can just get from uh, looking in the data. We had k different uh, point clouds given. How often do we reject among those? That gives an, uh, us an estimate of r. So this gives us a method. Uh, we draw null, null model point clouds. We standardize everything in sight, just like we did for the family-wise error rate. And then we go through all candidate cutoffs. And cutoffs won't change the rate of rejections other than at the point, uh, other than at the values that occur. So it's enough to look at cutoffs at the values estimated from the excess. And for each such cutoff, we estimate how many of the YIJs do we reject. We divide by the total number of YIJs. We estimate how many of the XIs do we reject, and we divide by the number of XIs. This gives us rates for V and rates for R at that cutoff. And so by dividing those rates, we get an estimated uh, false discovery rate at that cutoff. Now that we have all our false discovery rates, we can pick uh, we, we, we can pick the best uh, one that we can get so that we get the right uh, false discovery rate. Um, and once we have a nice C cutoff picked, we just reject everything that has a higher value than our cutoff. It might well be that we can't achieve the confidence level that we want. And we'll notice that by this family of QFDR CIs being too large. We couldn't possibly have a smaller false discovery rate than the minimal estimated value that we have from our data. That's a lower bound on the false discovery rate that we could achieve. And the same approach can be used for Robinson Turner style two sample testing, uh, where instead of using the null model and uh, data uh, test statistics, we just use the cost that they suggest. So we permute, we have a whole bunch of pairs of groups of persistence diagrams, and we can estimate the rejection rate by taking the cost of these, this family of pairs. And then we can estimate the uh, false rejection rate by looking at permutations within each pair and across all the H different pairs that we're running through, do a lot of permutations in each and collect up all those costs. And so this gives us a method for false discovery control for Robinson Turner style two sample testing. Calculate the costs of the observed group pairs, call those XK. Calculate the costs of permuting group membership within each pair. So for each K, we have a se separate pair of groups. We permute among those and we get YKJ as J varies. Now we do the same thing as before. We count how many times would we reject a YJK divided by the total number of YJKs. How many times would we reject an XK? We divide by the number of uh, Xs. This gives us an estimate for the false discovery rate for each possible cutoff. So we pick a good cutoff that keeps the false discovery rate below whatever level that we want it to stay below. And again, it might be that we can't get as low a false discovery rate as we want. And if we can't, then uh, looking at the minimum observed estimated false discovery rate gives us a bound on how well we could have possibly done. Now that I've laid out all of this, I want to give you at least some reason to believe in me. And starting out with false discovery rate control, it pretty much holds by construction. We're doing a pretty forward, straightforward estimation of uh, false discoveries, discoveries when we know the null model to be true, or the null hypothesis to be true. And we do estimate the total number of discoveries, namely how many discoveries are we making with the data that we're given. And by estimating these, we can 
just look through all possible cutoff values for the statistic that we're calculating and see what, how does the rate vary? How low can we get the rate? And we pick an appropriate uh, cutoff that gets us the rate that we want. For the, for the non-model case and for family-wise error rate, I've done simulations to get actual values out. And I remember now one slide that I forgot to create, namely a picture of how the point clouds I use for signal actually work. So I generate a whole bunch of non-model point clouds. And then to do a power estimation, to estimate the probability of detecting structure when there is structure, I generated points on unit circles in the plane, added Gaussian noise, and have two different standard deviations for the Gaussian noise. And uh, as the number of points goes up, we get uh, quite easy to recognize circles. But for very small point counts and large noise, it gets to the point where I couldn't, by eyeballing it, tell whether it was supposed to be a circle or not. Uh, which is a point that I want to emphasize once we get to our uh, to the numbers I'm displaying here. So, at in the bottom row here where it says 51%, 64%, 72%, at that uh, that's the region where the point, some of the point clouds aren't recognizable, and I think it's about a quarter or so of the point clouds that I simulate that fall in small enough sizes that they get hard to see. So uh, the 72% is getting pretty close to as good as it could have possibly been, given the, how the point clouds look. And so for, for a level, we're trying to keep track of uh, uh, having the probability of a false discovery low. And so the level here is the observed rate of false discoveries in a whole bunch of simulations. And so when I have a cutoff that should give me a 1% confidence level, I replicate that. If you aim for a 5% confidence level, I get a little bit higher observed level than that, but not that much. The same thing can be observed at a 10% and we get 12%, but we don't get dramatically much higher. With a pretty low noise level and a circle in the plane, we see the circle statistically. There's no question about it. And when the noise level goes up, we still see the circle reasonably often, given how difficult the point, uh, the point clouds get to recognize. This here is just for doing a single test. I have one point cloud. I want to see whether it's a circle. When I step it up to a multiple test, I have many point clouds, and I want to see if any one of them is a circle. Then it gets more difficult, because of course it gets more difficult. But we still have uh, roughly, well, within a factor two, three of the level that we set out to get in the level that we observe in our data. And we have a pretty high power for when the point cloud that I inject has a low level of noise, so it's very recognizable. And we still do, well, better than just guessing at least, uh, when the point cloud is uh, much noisier. And that these numbers that I'm flashing at you uh, in passing is pretty much where I wanted to end this talk. And so I want to thank you for listening. And I want to point out that we have a preprint up on the archive uh, with all of this, and that the slides that I've been showing you now are available on the internet. The link is in the chat at the bottom of this slide. Thank you very much for your attention. So uh, please unmute yourselves, all the participants. And uh, let's see, well, can I unmute you myself? Um, and let's uh, let's clap for uh, Mikael. And questions okay. for our speaker? I just muted you, so you'll have to unmute yourself again. That's a good question. 
I have a question to start, Mikael. So um, in these statistical tests, your um, what it means to see the circle is to be able to distinct to distinguish it from the noise model from the null model. Yeah. Yeah. So seeing the circle here means rejecting the hypothesis that the point cloud could have come from the null model. Right. I right. mean the concrete thing that I am doing rejecting the hypothesis that the null cloud null, that the point cloud could have been uniformly sampled. Uh huh. Uh huh. I see. And so, so for example, in a, I mean, you've made this statistically rigorous now, but in a specific example where I see some points that don't look like a circle, um, given how they were sampled, they still might be far away enough from your null model that the statistical task, uh, test identifies that. Well, if you ended up having two disconnected clusters, you should see something very similar. I didn't check that myself. I figured uh, degree one homology is a nice one to nice one to look at, and so that's uh, the one that I picked for my initial experiments to uh, have as a notion of signal. Another question: Are there um, uh... Data sets or mapper data sets that you plan to try out uh, at some point in the future with these techniques? If you have data sets you want to see tried out, uh, please get in touch with me. I don't have any concrete data sets that drive this research. This is more, as is the case with a lot of the research I do, a case of, well, this thing should be existing. I don't know who is going to find it useful, but someone is bound to find it useful and it should be a thing that exists. So I'm just going to go ahead and do it. Other questions for Mikhail? All right, thank you very much, Mikhail. Uh, let me end our recording now. Our next talk will be by Aaron Chambers in a couple of weeks.